In this video, we're going to talk about specifics about key parameters um, that we need to know before we go sample, and also that will be useful as we create sampling plans um, to figure out what parameters we might want to look at to look at and why um, in order to achieve our sampling goals. So we'll start out with you know, the most basic of parameters, temperature. This ends up being a really, really important one um, because it affects the rates of everything else. So um, what happens chemically and bio biologically oftentimes is controlled by temperature. So in general, chemical reaction rates are faster at higher temperatures. Biological me uh, metabolic rates are faster at higher temperatures. So you're going to have more things happening um, at higher temperatures. Um, in addition, uh, volatile chemicals are going to be, um, be more likely to evaporate out of warmer water than cool cooler water. Um, it's, all, it's very important for determining dissolved oxygen, um, pH, and conductivity. Um, we'll talk about this in a little while, but, um, but mo all of these parameters are temperature corrected, so it's really important to measure temperature. Um, really, right now, thermal alteration of aquatic systems is a, pretty important, um, is a pretty important environmental issue. So where we have warm water discharging from industrial applications or where, we, or where we've removed shading, so where we've removed the riparian corridor, um, thermal alteration ends up being a pretty important um, actual you know, type of pollution. Um, and so in, in the field, you can use a liquid and glass thermometer um, or, thermo or uh, temperature is built into almost all of the probes that we use. Um, we do not recommend that you use a mercury and glass thermometer in the aquatic environment. The potential for contamination is just far, far too high. Um, turbidity is another one of these basic, uh, basic parameters. Um, it describes how many, how many particles or what the suspended particle load is in a water sample. And so that's essentially how clear or how cloudy water is. Um, so what could be causing this turbidity or the lack of clarity? So it could be things like soil particles, it could be algae, it could be other substances like um, metals in the water um, that, cause, that cause turbidity. So it's measured by looking at how much light passes through um, passes through the sample. So how much light passes through it versus how much light is scattered by hitting solids. And so we use a spectrophotometer to run light through the sample and, and measure the intensity of water, or measure the intensity of the light that reaches the other side. Um, we can also use a, a less accurate method um, that um, is called a transparency tube to analyze the, um, to analyze the clarity of the water. Um, the two methods that will, and I'll show you both in class, the two methods are pretty well correlated, but using a, turbid, or a turbidimeter or a spectrophotometer is considered a, a higher quality measurement. Um, this is really an important parameter when we're looking at erosion and sedimentation, um, which is a pretty big issue, especially in agricultural watersheds. Um, this allows us to look at you know, the effects of runoff and the effect of, effects of erosion on the sedimentation of stream of stream habitat. Dissolved oxygen is pretty much what it sounds like. It's um, the measure of how much oxygen is dissolved in the water. This is one of those parameters that is very very important for aquatic life, um, and it also um, it also dictates a lot of chemical processes in the water. So, a water that tends to have more oxygen is going to have more oxidizing reactions happening in it. If it's, if it's oxygen limited, a lot of those oxidiz oxidization reactions will either proceed very, very slower or won't proceed at all. So this is really important also for looking at um, how you design water treatment systems because how the chemicals react with the water, especially chlorine, um, will be based on the dissolved oxygen. Um, so this is measured either in units of milligrams per liter of, of oxygen dissolved in the water or as a percentage saturation. Um, and so that's, and that's dependent on water temperature. So how much oxygen can be dissolved in the water um, at a, is temperature dependent. And so when we look at this percentage, it's the percentage of how much could be, um, could be dissolved in the water at that temperature. So this is either measured in the field using titration, um, which we actually don't do very commonly, or with a field probe, which is a much more common me method. Um, but 
generally, you want to measure this in the field because it's going to change pretty quickly, but there are some cases where you would do um, a lab titra titration. pH is, again, one of these parameters that governs a lot of other things. So in general, um, pH is um, the measure of hydrogen, hydrogen ions in solution. Um, and pH is controlled um, by the reactions that consume and produce hydrogen ions and that consume and produce hydroxide ions. So hydrogen ions are just a hydrogen. Hydroxide is an OH, and it's got a, a negative one charge. Um, and so what we're actually measuring is the hydrogen ion activity in the water. So this is a really critical factor in both chemical and biological processes in the stream. Um, for example, um, you know, aquatic life um, can survive at low and high pH, but you know, most aquatic organisms thrive in kind of the five and a half to eight and a half or nine pH range. And so if you have um, acidic or basic conditions that, um, that go beyond that range, you're going to have limited aquatic life. Um, so it's measured on a scale of, scale of 0 to 14, um, with 0 being very a strong acid and 14 being a strong base, um, and those are standard pH units. Um, we'll typically use pH probes, but there are also indicator strips, there are color wheels, there are um, a lot of different methods to, to, um, to test for pH. Um, but pH probes are going to be the most common one. Total alkalinity um, is an important parameter, especially in some of our acid um, or alkaline um, acid stress watersheds, especially. So, total alkalinity is the measure of um, a water's ability or a solution's ability to neutralize acid. And so, we measure it through titration by seeing how much acid it takes to reach a certain pH. So, um, in streams that are he heavily affected um, by acid, um, alkalinity and acidity could be present if the system is not in equilibrium. Um, or we may see only acidity with no alkalinity to buffer it. Um, we report it as milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate, as CaCO3. Um, this is um, kind of a standardized unit um, that aggregates the measure of all the different um, alkaline compounds in the water. So it's an aggregate of bicarbonate, carbonate, and hydroxide ions. Um, when we do a titration, um, when we do a titration to look at total alkalinity, depending on exactly what we're looking at and our solution type, um, we'll, we'll choose a pH endpoint. With our titration kits, what pH endpoint we're hitting depends on the co a color change, but you can also titrate with a pH probe to hit an exact pH endpoint. So the corollary to, to um, total alkalinity, or the opposite, would be total acidity. And this is the measure of a solution's ability to neutralize a base. Um, so this is the excess of hydrogen ions over basic ions. And we measure this by adding a base to an acidic solution until we reach a pH endpoint of 8.3. So total acidity, again, is, um, is, um, is represented in the units of milligrams per liter as CaCO3, so as that calcium carbonate equivalent. Um, it allows you to have an equivalent measure across both alkalinity and acidity and to look at the difference between the two. Um, So, so sorry, I was uh, looking, at, looking at what we have written on the slide here, and this mentions this pH of 4.2, and I, I told you that we titrate for acidity up to a pH of 8.3. Um, between a pH of 4.2 and 8.3, we can have both acidity and alkalinity. Below a pH of 4.2, we only have acidity, and above a pH of 8.3, we only have alkalinity. So when we look at solutions that have a pH um, that are between 4.2 and 8.3, we may have both. And so often we'll do both titrations um, to look at how much alkalinity and how much acidity we have, assuming that the system's not in equilibrium. Um, so we're moving into, um, from our field parameters, into um, nutrients. So 
Phosphorus is one of the most important nutrients in, um, in aquatic systems because this tends to be the limiting nutrient. So phosphorus limitation tends to be what limits growth of aquatic life. And in many systems, that keeps that growth from going off the rails. So when we have additions of phosphorus to the system, to aquatic systems, that often can drive algal blooms because nitrogen, which is the other nutrient that's required, is typically not limited. And so with more phosphorus, it leads to more growth. So it's the foundation for the food web, um, and it's often either organic or inorganic um, phosphorus. One of the really important things is that, um, that is that they can bind to soils and sediments really, really easily. So even if we don't have a high phosphorus level in, in a water body, if we have a lot of phosphorus in the sediment, that could be remobilized back into that water body um, and converted into inorganic phosphate, which are readily available for uptake by, um, by uh, organisms. So when we talk about um, nutrients, we're talking about phosphorus and nitrogen as our primary um, nutrients that we're looking at in an aquatic environment. Um, and nitrogen can be um, in the water in several different forms. Nitrate is, um, is the form that's essential to plant growth. So this is the one that's going to drive plant growth. Um, and it's often the ones that, one that is found in fertilizer runoff. Um, so excess nitrates can lead to, lead to increased plant growth. So while phosphorus is going to drive algal blooms, increase in nitrogen isn't, gonna, isn't going to help anything. It's going to limit them. Um, so typically in the field, we'll measure these with titration kits or um, with a colorimeter or something like that. But you can also take a sample, um, take a sample, um, preserve it, uh, typically by purging all the air, and then analyze it in the lab. So we talked about dissolved oxygen earlier, and oxidation reduction potential is related to dissolved oxygen in that it shows how oxidizing or reducing a solution is. And so in general, a high dissolved oxygen solution is going to have a high oxidation reduction potential, and a low dissolved oxygen solution will have a low oxidation reduction potential. But this is basically going to tell us, it's going to be a semi-quantitative um, measure of how, um, how much a, a water is going to oxidize or reduce. And so it's going to show us what we would expect to see um, and what sort of reaction we, we would expect to proceed in that solution. So it's, it's useful in kind of classifying an oxidizing versus reducing environment. Um, but other than that, it's, um, it's pretty much a semi-qualitative number, so the, the, or semi-quantitative measure. The, the specific number doesn't have a huge amount of meaning um, in, in most of our applications. So it's measured typically with a handheld probe, um, and it's measured in millivolts. Uh, temperature should always be recorded when you take an oxidation reduction potential measurement because they're related. One of the most um, common applications of oxidation reduction potential is in looking at, um, looking at the solubility states of different metals because they're going to be dependent on oxidation reduction potential and pH. When we talk about specific conductance or, spe or specific conductivity, this is a field parameter that we always must measure in the field. Um, in the literature, you'll see specific conductivity and you'll see conductivity. Um, the difference between those is that specific conductivity is corrected for the temperature of your solution, whereas conductivity assumes a standard temperature. So what we ought to be measuring is specific conductivity. And this is the measure of the water's ability to pass current through it. Um, so this is a really useful general screening, method, um, screening parameter um, for the quality of water. But it doesn't tell us what, what's in the water, it just tells us Kind of how many ions or how many how many different constituents are in that water passing electricity through the solution. Um, so it's it's a function of the type and the quantity both of dissolved substances in a solution. Um, we measured in microsiemens per centimeter and we measure it using a handheld probe. So typically, what this is going to mean is that you know if we have a solution that um, is really briny, 
or seawater or more polluted or has more dissolved constituents in it or hard water, you're going to have a higher conductivity. A very, very fresh water, a very soft water, a water coming straight out of a spring, um, distilled water, things like that are going to have a very low conductivity. In Appalachian, Ohio, we expect our background um, levels to be between about 500 and 800 microsiemens per centimeter. Often our mine waters um, are going to be more around 1,500 to 3,000 microsiemens per centimeter, whereas a hydraulic fracturing brine um, would be more like 100,000 microsiemens per centimeter, up to maybe 300,000 microsiemens per centimeter. So you have a big, a big range in different wastewaters. When we talk about pathogens and bacteria, fecal indicator bacteria are um, essentially what we're looking for. So there are different types of bacteria. When we talk about fecal indicator bacteria, those are going to be bacteria that are, that are indicative of warm water or warm blooded an animals um, feces in the water. Um, so they tend to be common ones because we don't want to use an indicator bacteria that we're not going to see very often. And they're things that tend to be a good indicator of raw sewage in the system. Um, so our most common kind of categories of bacteria that are measured are total coliforms, which are all basically all bacteria. Fecal coliforms, those are the ones that are associated with feces of warm-blooded warm animals. And E. coli. And E. coli is going to be the one that's most indicative for um, human health applications. So we'll just break that down. So total coliform is going to be all the fecal coliform and all the non-fecal uh, bacteria. And this is used for drinking water purposes because we want to have no coliforms in our drinking water, um, whether they're from fecal sources or not. Fecal coliform then are kind of a subset under that umbrella of the total coliforms that measure, um, that measure coliforms that are directly related to feces of, of warm-blooded animals. So this could be raw sewage or it could be animal waste. Um, and it could be farm animals, or it could be, um, or it could be native. Um, any any of those are going to have the same that same set of fecal coliforms. We then have the subset of fecal bacteria, um, E. coli, which is specific to human um, and and warm-blooded animal feces, and it's the best indicator of human health risk. And so, in Ohio, fecal coliform and E. coli are what are used um, to judge um, contamination due to. Um, due to sewage. So that's the end of um, this video about specific um, key parameters, key water quality parameters that we look at. Um, we'll talk about this more in class and we'll look at, look at how we sample for each of these in the field. Thank you for listening.